America is headed for the polls later this year in what can only be described as the most important presidential elections in not only American history, but also world history. But the only two real candidates that are coming forth so far are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. But if in a country with over 300 million inhabitants, we only have these two options as the future leader of the free world, the world is in deep trouble. I've just completed an interview with one candidate who is not part of the establishment, presidential candidate Marianne Williamson, who previously ran for the presidency in 2020, is running again. And she should be a real contender and a real alternative for Americans to vote for. Her values, her beliefs and her policies are different from those of Biden and Trump and something I believe the world needs right now. And for this reason, I decided it was important to shed the spotlight on her and understand more better what her views and policies are, and in particular on Gaza and the war between Israel and Hamas. So I share with you this interview and I encourage you all to watch it. Thank you for taking time out of your campaign to do this interview with me, Marianne. I know you have a relentless schedule and every minute of your time is valuable. So I, I really appreciate the pres your presence with me today. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you so much for taking your time uh, to allow me to have this conversation with you. I appreciate it. I want to provide a short bio to audiences across the US and also the world who might not know you or have the full picture of the breadth of your talent and experience. So let me just set the scene for people who, who are on who you are and why you're an important person to take note of, both on the local scene in the US, but also on the global scene. You're a renowned author, spiritual leader, and politician. Your books include the New York Times bestseller, A Return to Love, which was published in 1992, and revered by Oprah Winfrey, on whose shows you've been a regular guest, who you became a spiritual advisor to. But your career and your life journey has taken a different path, a political path. And in 2014, you ran for Congress as an independent candidate in California. And whilst unsuccessful, you did secure an impressive 13.2% of the vote. You didn't allow that to stop you. And in 2020, you ran as a Democratic candidate in the presidential elections. Eventually, you dropped out and endorsed Bernie Sanders but we know that he was beaten by Joe Biden, who became the president. Now you're running again for president and again as a Democratic candidate in what could only be described as the most important presidential elections in not only American, but world history. And I say that because the unconscionable war being waged on the citizens of Gaza by the state of Israel following the horrific attacks by Hamas on October 7, has only been allowed to continue for, for, for now more than three months due to the unrestrained and unconditional support given to Israel by the President of America and the vast majority of lawmakers across the U US through moral, political, financial and military aid being given to Israel to the tune of bin billions and billions of dollars. So my first question to you is, firstly, in a country the size of America with over 300 million people, it's confounding to think that there are only two real contenders for the presidency, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. So it's a relief to us to see candidates such as yourself providing people with another alternative and hopefully one whose policies and values differ to those of Biden and Trump. Do you feel that you are the right person with the right capabilities to step up, to take on this historic responsibility that will determine the fate of all humanity, not just America. 100%. The political elite that now dominates American politics is stuck in a worldview, a transactional worldview based on 20th century thinking. This is a new century. It's holistic, far more whole person, far more transformational. People today don't just want to think about data. You have such an uprising of conscience and an uprising of activism 
um, in rejection of the president's policies. It's there's no uh, lack of understanding, at least among most people, that the acts of October seventh horrific. They were evil. There is absolutely no uh, justification for minimizing that in any way. However, the moral clarity that the president uh, showed, the appropriate moral clarity that he showed on October 7th, has been lacking in response to the war on Gaza that occurred later. And we need, uh, the United States needs to show a, a robust and an equal commitment to the peace and the security and the sovereignty of both peoples. You know, our Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal. And that doesn't just mean all Americans. And that's our moral North Star. Yes, Israel is our ally, but our highest alliance should be with humanity itself. Mm -hmm. And this war on Gaza transgresses against our own traditional values. And for that reason, um, in no way should be supported with our with our military or with our money. I know what is just and what is unjust. Mm -hmm. What the Palestinians have endured for decades is unjust. What is happening now is immoral and unacceptable, and we must get beyond it. That's the level of conversation that I'm interested in and that I would seek to effectuate as president. What then is your stance regarding a two-state solution for Palestine and Israel? We've now heard straight from the horse's mouth, Prime Minister Netanyahu, that he does not and has actively worked against a two-state solution for more than 30 years, which contra contradicts American policy. But this is not new and, in fact, has been a hidden policy of all Israeli governments to disrupt the peace process so as not to ever allow Palestinians to have self-determination. And that's not me saying that, but rather people like Israeli peace negotiator Daniel Levi, who was involved in the peace talks that led to the Oslo B peace accords, among others. So where do you stand on a two-state solution and on Israel in particular, because it appears America's closest ally has no regard or respect for the president or political leaders or American foreign policy on Palestine and never did? A two-state solution is the only solution, and it always was. I certainly agree with everything said about Netanyahu. I don't believe that every uh, Israeli prime minister uh, was working behind the scenes against it. Rabin gave his life, as a matter of fact, uh, in order to try to further true peace, genuine peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But in terms of Netanyahu, you're absolutely correct. And you're correct that he's saying it even now. So President Biden is saying he'll get there. No, I'm so tired of waiting Bibi Netanyahu to get there. And I don't believe that he is going to get there. The group uh, himself, Ben Gavir, and others who are running this entire operation at this time are, to me, um, absolutely detrimental to peace in that region, absolutely detrimental to any solution that will work for Israelis or for Palestinians. It's also to be noted that the major uh, Arab leaders in that part of the world also say that they, the solution is a two-state solution. We need an international consortium at this point. The United States cannot lead that consortium, but the United States can and should be a passionate and vigorous partner within it. It should be mainly led, primarily led for people in that region. We all know uh, leaders do not want to see a widening of this of this war, want to see a regional war. God forbid uh, Iran should get involved. It is to the benefit of everyone except Benjamin Netanyahu, literally everyone except Benjamin Netanyahu, to have a ceasefire, to have a release of those hostages, and to have an immediate conference to start the difficult work of making way for a two-state solution. So why do you say it's detrimental to Bibi Netanyahu, mostly? For him to continue or to, for us to have a two-state solution? Or to have a two-state solution. And I say that everybody wants a two-state solution except for him and his deep, uh, and his major cohorts. And many people talk about the fact that, you know, he it's much like Donald Trump here. And he is very comparable as a political figure to Donald Trump in the United States. Bibi Netanyahu knows that on the other side of all this, he's in trouble. Do you believe then that Israel in its current state and under its current leadership is a fascist apartheid state occupying Gaza and the West Bank and oppressing the Palestinians? That language, I, I will not enroll fully in that language. I think that there are aspects of laws 
within Israel that are a tied element. I do not think it is a full, I mean, there are Arab members of the Knesset and so forth. I think that word applied to something like the West Bank is like it goes without saying. I think the West, the occupation of the West Bank is illegal. I think the settlements are illegal. And I believe that the siege and the blockade of Gaza constitute a continuation of the occupation. We've seen rolling protests across the USA, growing in number and across many states. One group in particular that has been the loudest, uh, making the loudest noise has been the American Jewish groups who launched the Not In My Name movement. As a Jew yourself, are you aligned with these groups and their sentiment towards Israel? <clears throat> I just want to point this out because for me as a journalist and a student of the Middle East and, and the crisis, it's really historic for me to see so many Jewish people come out for the first time around the world, not just America, all over the world, speaking out against the violence, speaking out against the aggression, speaking speaking for peace. And even in Israel over the weekend, massive uh, demonstration between Arabs and Jews calling for peace. Now, for me, looking at it, I was actually very... Um, taken aback by it and very happy because I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm all for Jews having a homeland. I'm all for peace in the region and I'm all for justice for everyone. And it was really heartening to see people who could identify themselves as Jews saying this behaviour is wrong and do not do it in our name. We want peace, we want our rights, but we don't want this done in this way. So that's what has really triggered people around the world, especially the, you know, on social media to really get behind because no one wants an increase in anti-Semitism around the world. No one wants a rise in Islamophobia. That's not what this is about. I think it's actually put the lid on more anti-Semitism because we've seen genuine, you know, ethical Jewish people around the world siding on the side of justice and, and and peace. So that's where we're coming across, well, I'm coming from in this in this respect. I'm a Jewish woman who has been criticizing Israeli policies towards the Palestinians for decades. I have never not used my voice in justice against Palestinians perpetrated by the Israeli government. And I'm on record for it. The uprising of ethical Jewish voices Calling for a ceasefire, I'm all for that. The uprising of uh, of ethical Jewish voices, having done so uh, and talking about uh, the perpetration of injustice towards uh, Palestinians for decades, I have been all for. And I have used my voice for this purpose both here in the United States and in Israel. That's true. However, we are living at a time where Every, you can support those voices, which I do support those voices, without pointing to a particular organization and say, I support this voice or that voice, when it is there is absolute evidence that some organizations are not what they appear to be. And the truth of the matter is, Daisy, even though I certainly believe you, and I think that's true of many, many people, many people, it is, I believe, untrue to say that none of us are coming from an anti-Semitic place because there are people who are coming from an anti-Semitic place. Let me touch on something a little bit um, controversial, which has really come out. And there's been a lot of um, information that's been uh, shared around the world on this. And this is the, the APAC group, um, which <clears throat> has now been exposed as basically running America, or at least it is considered the most powerful lobby um, that can determine whether a candidate wins or loses in many areas uh, of the USA. I want to ask you directly, have you ever received any financial support from oh, APAC? No, no, but I can, I can talk to you a little bit about APAC. APAC has changed in the last few years. There was a time when APAC said, and legitimately so, hey, we're just for whatever the policies of uh, Israel are at a particular time. And there was a time, let's say 15, 20 years ago, when, yeah, there was a lobby. And by the way, when you just said they run America, they don't run any America any more than big oil lobby does, or the defense contracting lobby does, or the National Rifle Association does. So this is where Jews have a difficulty. I agree that the influence of APAC, because they changed in the last few years, and they admit that they changed in the last few years. And this time they're using tremendous lobbying power to influence 
uh, elections in a way that will make it very difficult for any candidate, even a Jewish candidate, which happened in the case of Andy Levin, even a Jewish candidate who in any way does not toe the line with the right wing government of Israel. It is terrible. I condemn it. Absolutely. Now, as a Jew, let me tell you where this becomes a trigger for Jewish people. No more so than the NRA, no more so than big oil, and no more so than defense contractors. So when people cross that line and say they run America, what comes up for us is that ancient trope, oh, the Jews are controlling everything. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? The sort of bind that it puts us in. Do I condemn the way they behave politically? Absolutely. No more or less than I condemn the way the NRA, the big oil companies, uh, defense contractors, and so forth. So Jews are so triggered by anything that has that, oh, well, we know the Jews are in control, uh, which is the, the sort of the, the, the precursor chemical, mm-hmm. right, for huge anti-Semitism, and it scares us. You have actively and openly spoken about the fragmentation of the American political system, saying it's now baked into the cake that our corrupted political system is at the service of the few at the expense of the many. Who do you think is responsible for allowing American the American political system in America that purports to symbolise freedom, democracy and justice to have veered so far away from these values? And who is it serving, if not the many? There was an economist named James Buchanan back in the 1960s who wrote uh, about how the only way to protect the primacy of property rights was to put democracy in chains. Those were his words. This is documented in a very interesting book by Nancy McLean, if you haven't read it, called Democracy in Chains. Mm -hmm. The Koch brothers, who have been a tremendous right wing influence on American politics for decades now, um, The Koch brothers read Buchanan's work, and they were the ones who set about originally to basically funding the transition of America to a place where, in service of the primacy of property rights, democracy would be put in chains. Some people feel that much of this neoliberal trickle-down economics um, began with some austerity with Jimmy Carter, but it came on full-blown as an economic paradigm that would come to dominate America with the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Mm. The Republicans started it, but no Democrat has really stopped it. Mm. Democrats slow it down. Democrats try to deal with it. But that's why I'm running for president. It has created such an economic injustice in this country. And the way I see someone like President Biden, he's trying to ameliorate the suffering ameliorate the stress of people who are living within this uh, inherent economic injustice. I want to end the injustice. You spoke of a real threat of a a fascist takeover of America, quoting Franklin Roosevelt, who said, we wouldn't have to worry about a fascist takeover in America so long as democracy delivered on its promises. You're campaigning on domestic issues, including economy, health, jobs, housing, which are all in major meltdown across America. Do you feel the these are the failures that Roosevelt was referring to or something else? Well, Roosevelt was living in a different time, of course. And he was he was dealing specifically with the, with the Great Depression in which, you know, there was unemployment rate at, um, you know, 30 percent in this country. So some of the details were different. But in terms of the basic pattern, the basic dynamic by which a few are served at the expense of the many. That's exactly what he was dealing with. And that's exactly what we're dealing with now. And I think that his words um, are deeply resonant now. Listen, is Donald Trump a neo-fascist? Absolutely. But my view as an American and as a Democrat is fascism should never have gotten so close to the door. And that's why I believe that the Democratic Party has to look in the mirror ourselves. All this trying to be Republican light all these years, playing to a mythical center rather than standing for the traditional values of the Democratic Party, unequivocal advocacy for the working people of the United States. That's where we should have been. That's where we should be. And that's the only way we're going to win in 2024. What is the single most important consideration you would encourage all Americans to think about when voting in the upcoming presidential elections? I was reading a book recently where it was talking about how neuroscientists and others in the medical field have discovered that there's more of a 
highway and a partnership between the brain and the heart than had previously been recognized. That whereas previously they had thought that the, the brain was the central intelligence of the body, the brain in partnership with the heart is the, the intelligence center of the body. I feel the same way about a country and the same way with a uh, species. I would ask that voters think with their brain and also think with their heart. We should have public policy that is predicated on the idea that the government should help people. If the government is spending money that is your tax dollars, then why wouldn't your tax dollars go to things that would help you and your family thrive? That is what I would like the voter to consider. Whose policies will contribute to the repair, not of our economy as something out there separate from us, an economy should serve the people. People shouldn't serve the economy. What policy and whose policies would help you? Help you so that you could get health care. Help you so that there would not be carcinogens in your food and PFAS in your water. Would help you so that you or your children could go to college. Would help you so that you could have subsidized child care. Would help you family leave. And help you so that you could have a guaranteed living wage and a guaranteed sick pay and housing and affordable housing. And I just described is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy. Americans have been trained to expect too little. Americans have been trained to limit our political imaginations to the point where really aligning with the kinds of things that I just said, which poll after poll after poll show are where we sit. People have been almost trained to think that's somehow asking for too much. Yeah, I think that's... Um... That's uh, true around the world, actually. Governments around the world are making people feel that way in every country, you know. We expect too much. We're entitled, you know. Right, and that's yeah. just socialism and okay for them to feel entitled. <laughs> true. So before my last question, I want to ask you if there is any other message that you specifically want to put out there on your campaign and why it's important to vote for Marianne 2024. One of the pillars of my campaign is um, my desire to establish a U.S. Department of Peace. We need to look at peace and war the way we look at health and sickness. Sickness is the absence of health. Health is not the absence of sickness. And war is the absence of peace. Peace is not the absence of war. There is nothing more detrimental to national or international security than large groups of desperate people. Large groups of desperate people form a petri dish out of which all manner of personal and societal dysfunction is almost inevitable, including vulnerability to ideological capture by genuinely psychotic forces. A Department of Peace seeks to, as Franklin Roosevelt said, not just end war, but end the beginnings of all wars. A Department of Peace means not only would we have a military academy, we would have a peace academy. Not only would we have an army of military personnel, we would have an army of peace builders. Not only would we play war games, we, could all, we should also play peace games. Mm. What this means is that we recognize that anything we do to expand economic opportunities for women, educational opportunities for children, the reduction of, of violence against women, and the amelioration of unnecessary human despair helps create peace. And this, this applies to Gaza. This applies to any, any corner of a U.S. city. It applies to any corner of the world. Help people thrive. Help people live better lives. Give people justice. Treat people with dignity and respect and with love. That and only that is the way that we will do, dissolve violence and ultimately save the human race. We cannot continue the way we are, Daisy. We have 12,000 uh, nuclear bombs on the planet. 7,000 of them belong to the United States. We, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy said that mankind will get rid of war or war will get rid of mankind. We are skating way too close to the edge. And what I want to do as president is to imagine a planet without war a hundred years from now, and then seek to reverse engineer from there. Now, many people would say that that's very naive. I think what's naive is to think that there's a guarantee that this species will even inhabit this planet for another hundred years if we don't at least try. 
It's a, we, we need a fundamental break with the past. And that is what is going to begin a new chapter, not only in American history, but I think in world history. I also think, and I would, I would bet that you agree with me on this, what I see happening in the United States is what I sense is happening all over the world. There's a new generation of consciousness, mainly within the young, but also it, it's not just about physical age. There's a regenerative peace building. And, and, and I must say, part of, to me, the tragedy of what's going on in Israel and Palestine is that I've known so many people, Jewish and Arab, Muslim and Jewish, Israeli, who carry within themselves the seeds of a new beginning. And powered by, any more by the Palestinian Authority than by Bibi Netanyahu. And I see that here in the United States. The problem we have in the world, certainly the problem we have in the United States as well as any place else, the people with solutions don't have the power. And the people with power don't necessarily want to, to listen to the people who have genuine solutions because people with genuine solutions are coming from heart. They're coming from a sense of the sacred relationship that binds us to one another and to the earth and to food and to animals. That doesn't necessarily increase corporate profits. That doesn't necessarily foster the geopolitical dynamic that now dominates. But that dynamic is going to fall. It is either going to fall violently or it is going to fall wisely and lovingly. And nothing could be more urgent than that we support within ourselves and within each other, in all of our nations, this emergence of a, a new world that is struggling to be born, that will be guided forward uh, and uh, move forward and given birth to by a different kind of policy that puts our love for each other first and puts justice first and is, is not as uh, obedient to old fashioned notions yeah. of nation state domination and control. I pray that uh, that wish comes true because it really is, that is a great vision for our world. Um, and you're absolutely right about identifying and polarizing the two energies that are pulling, you know, that should be working together, but are pulling the world apart because it's those vested interests. Um, one coming from the heart, one coming from the pocket, the, you know, that uh, bank account, more looking at the bottom line rather than humanity. My final question to you is, do you call for a ceasefire in, in Gaza? Absolutely, I call for a ceasefire in Gaza and always have. Not only did I call for a ceasefire the minute the war started, I called even before uh, the war began for the war not to happen. I talked even before the war about the fact that an invasion, a military invasion of Gaza would be a terrible idea. Unequivocally, absolutely, um, and strongly, and as president, I would make sure of it. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you for taking the time. And I wish you the very best with your campaign. I hope people get behind you because we do need an alternative to what we know is already going to be a disaster if we continue with the two options that we have ahead of us. So God bless you and keep you safe. And Thank you. I wish you the best in the campaign. Thank you so, so much. Thank you.